Hi, my name is Shayan, and today I'm going to talk about a comprehensive column question in Strength of Materials. So let's read the question. The question says a built-up column is made up of 10 C250 times 45 structural steel channels welded together. So the first thing is, what does this mean? So C250 times 45 means that the depth of our channel section is 250 millimeters, and the weight the dead weight of our steel channel is 45 kilonewton per meter. So we're not going to use this value in this question, but this is the more the most important part. And since the column is fixed fixed about the XX axis and hinged fixed about the YY axis with a height of 15 meters. Uh, and this is basically the fixity condition of our column. We're going to use them in this slenderness calculation. And the load P is applied as shown in the figure, assuming that the modular elasticity is 200 GPA, yield stress 350 megapascal, and the bending stress 220 megapascal. Determine the maximum load or the capacity of the column using the allowable stress and interaction methods. And these are the geometrical properties of the column. So let's basically first discuss the, the basically the geometrical properties and what each of these values mean. So First, so this is our channel section, and this is the local XX axis, and this is the local YY axis. So 250 millimeters, which we saw here, C250, is the depth of the channel, right? The depth of the channel from the top edge to the bottom edge. And these are called flange. So this, this is flange, and this is another flange. We have two flanges here, and this is the web of the channel. So the flange width is 776 millimeter, which is here. The moment of inertia about xx axis about yy axis again it's important to note that this is the moment of inertia about this axis basically this is just the name xx right the moment of inertia of a channel about this axis and we have the radius of gyration about xx and yy we're not really going to use these individually since our channel is completely new is made up of different uh, channel sections and the other important value is this xc value which is basically the distance from the edge of the web to the centroid of our channel section in the x direction, right? So this value 16.3 represents this distance. So we have two formulas for interaction methods and uh, allowable stress methods. So this, this is the formula for allowable stress method, and this is the formula for the interaction method. So th the thing is, okay, so we have this formula and we need to find P. So MXX again has a component of P, YY has a component of P. So we have to find that value, but the thing is, okay, what about the other values? So basically if we find all the other values in this formula, we'll be able to basically solve this inequality and this inequality to basically uh, find our capacity or P that we are looking for. So to find this sigma allowable and to find basically uh, find out basically which axis is more critical, we have to determine this sigma allowable determine this ixx and iyy to plug it into this equation. Now, there are a few steps. So let's break down the steps that we're going to follow to solve this type of question. So the first step is to calculate the moment of inertia about xx and yy axes and any other applicable secondary axis. That's very important. Now, if we have, probably you could see that there we could have a critical axis about this axis and this axis. We're not really going to consider the secondary axis for this question, but it's very important to consider them in, uh, in reality because your buckling can occur about any axis. The next step is to determine the radius of gyration. Again, we need this radius of gyration to determine our slenderness. So we determine this radius of gyration from the formula that we know, and then we go and calculate the relative slenderness which is KL over R. So we calculate them for each axis. And we basically take the higher value as the more slender or the more critical axis and proceed with our calculation for the next steps. The next step is basically just to follow the quote that we have and see if our column is slender, short or intermediate. And then basically again, follow the calculation in the code and find the sigma allowable and then just plug it back to the formula that we have here for allowable stress interaction method and basically solve for P. Now let's start with the first step. The first step that we need to follow is finding IXX and IYY. So let's start with IXX. If we want to find the moment of inertia of this cross section about this IXX, we have to basically account for the contribution of each of these channel sections 
to the moment of inertia, right? To everything that we have. So the best approach is to group some of these channels together to make it to make the calculation easier for ourselves. Because you can obviously, you know, consider each of these channels separately, this channel separately, this channel separately, and all of them separately and add them together. But if you just look a little closely, you can see that these values, the moment of inertia for these sections will be actually the same. The same applies for five and six. Why? Because the moment of inertia is the same, obviously, because they are the same channel. But the parallaxis theorem, which has an, a, a term a, the area times the distance squared, the distance from the neutral axis is the same for five and six, same for seven and eight, and same for nine and 10. So that's why we group these channels together and we proceed with our calculation. So let's start with the first uh, step. So this is what we mentioned. So it's for ixx1, y, because basically we're accounting for the, the, the values of all, all of these four channels, basically one, two, three, four, with one value for one of them. So just the ixx1, just multiply them by four because each of them has the same effect, basically. Same for two ixx5 for the blue and green and this uh, basically uh, brown uh, sections that you can see. Now, let's start with the calculation of ixx1. So basically, we just have to find each of these values separately and then use this formula, add them together, find the moment of inertia. So here, you can see that we have used 1.60. So this is the moment of inertia locally of this cross-section. And you might think that, okay, here we mentioned 42.8 times 10 to the power of 6. But let's take a look at our channel. This is the channel that we're looking at. And this is the property that we're given. So this axis which is what the axis, the global xx axis that we're looking for, this axis is the same as this yy axis, right? And it's very important to know. And that's why we're using this iyy value, right? Because that's the geometry, because the channel is inverted. So this, this is not ixx. The ixx that we would consider here would be this channel, this, this axis, which is not what we are looking for, right? We're looking for the y the yy axis here, right? So the global xx axis, or here, the yy axis, which is this one. So that's why we use 1.60 times 10 to the power of 6. So whatever parallel, so the global axis is this. Just find the parallel axis in terms of centroid for this channel and calculate, just take the centroid, take the moment of inertia about this axis, right? Which is this yy, right? That's what we did. Plus the basically the parallel axis theorem, right? This is the area of the channel, this channel, plus the distance from the centroid of this channel to the global xx axis, which in this case is this flange width, right? It's this distance, right? It's the flange width minus this centroid distance that we mentioned, which is this distance. So it's 76 minus 16.3. And this is basically what we mentioned. And next, again, we're going to calculate ixx5. So ixx5 will be, again, this one, which is basically the moment of inertia locally of this section about the xx, which is this, uh, basically, axis, and which is this axis is this one again, right? It's yy. So we take 1.60 times 10 to the power of 6 plus the area multiplied by the distance of this, this from the centroid of this channel section to the global centroid, right? And this is going to be basically the half of the depth, right, half of the depth, plus a flange width, plus another flange width, minus this, basically the xc that we know, right, so it's 250 divided by 2, half of the depth, plus 2 times 76, flange width, minus the xc value, square, right. Same thing for ixx7, so ixx7, again, the same thing, you see, like, the, the only difference is the distance, right, the distance is half of the depth, plus this xc value, right, because this is the centroid right this is centroid and you can see this xx7 right this is what we calculated so this is the xx7 the distance is d7 and this is the distance right the half of the depth plus the xc value that we know which is 250 divided by 2 plus 16.3 and finally we have ixx9 in this case actually the parallel axis theorem really doesn't apply and the reason is this is the xx axis and this is the xx axis so they are basically on the same uh, line so it means that our distance is zero. So the parallax theorem does not apply here because the local centroid and the global centroid are basically the same. 
So we will just use 42.8. And again, why are we choosing 42.8? In this case, for 9, for example, this is exactly what our channel looks like in our real cross section. So because of that, we just use 42.8, right? So as you can see, again, the difference for 5, 8, 7, for all of these, because the channel is inverted, we used 1.60. But in this case, this looks exactly the same. So just use the IXX that we know, right? 42.8. Now we just use this formula that we have at the top, add the values together, and we calculate 1.1802, right? And again, like before, going to the calculation of IYY, the centroid of the whole cross section is known, right? Because the section is basically symmetric. So we know the global YY and the global XX axis. So that's known. But if it's not, obviously, our first step is to calculate the uh, centroid of our column. Now, we are basically going to follow the same thing, same process for the YY axis. So the first thing, again, is to group them all together. So how can we group them? So one, two, three, four, Y, because this is the YY axis. And the moment of inertia of each channel is going to be the same for each of these groups about the yy axis, right? Why? Because the distance is the same. We're going to group basically five, six, seven, and eight the same way, right? Five, six, seven, and eight. So about the yy axis, they have the same distance. Basically, the distance is zero, right? The distance from the centroid of these channels to the centroid of the global centroid of the whole cross section is the same. And the same for eight, basically nine and 10. So nine and 10, again, about the yy axis, we have the same distance, right? The distance is known. Now, again, as you can see, the same, same, same thing. So one, two, three, four, because they have the same moment of inertia, we'll just say four i y one, which represent from one to one, two, three, and four. Four i y y five, the yellow uh, numbers that you can see, five, six, seven, eight, represent five, six, seven, and eight, and of two i y y nine. So let's start with the calculation of i y y one. For the calculation of IYY1, we have the, so this is our, the global YY axis, the global YY axis. And here, this is the YY axis, basically the par parallel YY axis that we need to find, right? So this is the YY axis. So what is the YY axis here? So if we invert this section, it's this one, right? So this is this axis or this axis. It's this axis, right? This is the XX axis for the value we are given in the geometric properties. So because this axis represents this xx axis, we're going to use 42.8 times 10 to the power of 6. So we say 42.8 times 10 to the power of 6 plus the parallel axis theorem, which is 5690, the area of the channel section, multiplied by the distance from the centroid of this individual channel to the global centroid of the whole cross section, which is basically this distance which is half of the depth, plus this distance, which is again half of the depth, so two times half of the depth. So this is what we mentioned, right? So D1 value, and the area is the area of a single cross-section. And I YY5, so in this case, it's actually pretty easy because we don't need to apply the parallel axis theorem in this case. Why? Because the centroid of this individual channel is actually on the same line as the global centroid. So I, y, y axis, this y, y axis is the same for both this section and the whole section. So there's the distance is basically zero. So we just take the moment of inertia of this channel about the y, y axis. But which one, which value should we take again? This 1.60 or 42.8? We have to take 42.8. And the reason is again, see this axis? So this axis, if you invert this channel, it's going to look like this. And which channel, which axis is that? Is XX axis, right? It's going like through this channel like this. So because it's the XX axis, we choose 42.8. And the same thing applies for IYY9. But in this case, we can see that about YY axis, which axis are we looking at? It's this axis, right? It's this axis. Because it's this axis, we can see from our figure that this is this axis, right? This YY. So we'll take the YY axis, plus 5690, which is the area, multiplied by distance. What is the distance? It's this D9, right? From the centroid of this channel to the global centroid, right? In this case, the, the distance is basically half of the depth minus the XC value, right? Half of the depth, which is here, right? Half of the depth 
minus this xc value from here, right? So half the depth minus the xc value. And then again, we use the final formula to calculate our i, y, y, nu. So the, the final value is known here, so 1.9026. Now we will use all of these values to basically calculate uh, our slenderness and radius of gyration. So in, in the next step, we can see that we need to determine the rx and ry because we basically what we are trying to do in the first four steps is to determine which axis is actually more critical. So we have to determine rx and ry. So what is the formula for the radius of gyration? It's basically the moment of inertia divided by area. So if you want to calculate it, calculate them separately for each axis, ixx nu we found it. Area is basically the area of the whole cross section, which is 10 times the area. And in this case, we're going to end up with 144 millimeter for rx and 183 millimeters for ry. And the reason is again, ry again is, is iyy nu for the whole cross section that we just found. And the total area of the cross section is 10 channels, right? 10 channels that we used, 10 times 569. So, and the next step is again, like as I mentioned, is the slenderness value. So we have to determine the slenderness about each axis, lambda x and lambda y, which is kx lx r over rx for lambda x. So LX is known as the length of the column, 15,000 millimeters. RX, we just found it, 144 millimeters. But what about KX? If you remember in the question that we had, we said that the column is fixed, fixed about the XX axis. And that's why we're using 0 0.5. And again, you can use, you can find these conditions and the values in any strength of material books. Um, but the impo important values that for hinge, hinge, you can, it's one for fixed, fixed, 0 0.5 for hinge fixed that we use here is 0 0.7 um, and for cantilever it's uh, it's two but in this case the, the, this is sufficient for our question so this is 0 0.5 we know it's fixed fixed and the, the radius of gyration known we get this value for lambda y it's hinged fixed we have to use 0 0.7 and the length is 15,000 divided by 183 we get this value a very important note here is that we have to use basically millimeter or meter consistently because slenderness is unitless. So we have to basically end up with a unitless number, right? So, and that's very important. So we use millimeter, which I just decided to use millimeter for both. Of them. So these are the values we get. And this basically indicates that the higher value basically means more slender. Yes, right, the more slenderness. So we can see that the lambda y is higher. So because this value is higher, we'll see that this governs, basically this is a more critical axis. So because lambda y is greater than lambda x, and it is like basically 57.4, we will see that the consequently the yy axis is more critical. And basically we will say, that, okay, because yy axis is more critical, we will choose this axis for our further calculation that we will continue with, with the code. So remember this value, right? This slenderness is 57.4. We basically, for the fifth step, we have to follow the code. The first step for us is basically to see which, which category our column falls under. So here, we can see that we have to know what CC is, what L over R is. Now, we, we, the code that we're using here is a ninth edition of Manual of Steel Construction 1989. And, you know, of course, this is a, because we're using factor of safety in the strength of materials, um, these formulas do not apply right now. But in the strength of a material column questions, these are this is the basically most recent you can find. So this and currently, of course, the load and resistant factor design is being used. But so here we need to find CC and L over R. So what is CC here? CC is this formula. So CC squared is this value. So we basically have to find CC, 2 pi squared E over sigma 1. Another very important note, the consistency of units, right? Because CC is again unitless. So because 200 GPA is given for our modulus of elasticity, we have to use 200,000 MPA to match with this yield stress 350 megapascal that we were given for steel. So we find this value as 106.2, and we're going to compare it with the slenderness. So if you remember, the slenderness lambda y, which was KL, KY LY over RY, was found to be 57.4. And, and you might ask, okay, this is L though, so there's no K. But as you can see here, it's the effective ratio. And in this note, you can see that the effective length L prime must be used, right? So basically from by L here, they mean KL, 
right? And this basically this this term here means the slenderness that we found, right? Lambda y, k l over r, which was 57.4. So from here we can see because 57.4 is basically larger than zero and less than or equal to 106.2 that we just found here, it falls under this category for compression block or intermediate range. So we have to use the formulas for basically this range, right? It's very important. So basically, with the, after this step, we're just going to follow this step, fact, find a factor of safety, and find the signal allowable, and put it back into our formula. So in this step, we have to determine signal allowable. But for determining that, first we need the factor of safety value. Factor of safety is this has this formula, right? And L prime over R is again the slenderness that we calculated, 57.4, and CC is the value that we found. So we follow the calculation and we end up with this number, right? So 57.4 divided by the CC value, slenderness divided by the CC value, and is what we did. And we basically use, as you can see, that's why we found a factor of safety, right? The sigma allowable formula is this one, and it's basically 350 megapascal divided by factor of safety. We just plug it back into the formula. Again, L prime over R is the slenderness we just found, we know, which is 57.4, CC is known, and we just plug it back, plug back everything into the formula, and we find this value. So this is the value we were looking for all along, right? 161.56 MP. So this value that we obtain will be used in the allowable stress and interaction method formulas. Now, so in step seven, we're going to talk about basically, basically, we're basically going to determine the capacity of the column. We're just basically going to substitute the values into the formulas that we have. So let's start with the allowable stress method. So for the allowable stress method, we have this formula. So what we are going to do is basically uh, find the p value that we have. So mxx has p and myy has p. Wow. So for mxx, how do we have p? So what is the definition of the moment? Moment is basically the action of the force perpendicular to the axis that we are calculating. So it's basically the force p multiplied by the perpendicular distance from this xx axis. So we could basically write this mxx as the value of p multiply by this distance. And what is this distance? The distance is half of the depth plus a flange width plus another flange width, right? So 250 divided by 2 plus 2 times the flange width, right? And now that was our mxx, right? That's basically the force, the distance, of the, the p, the force p multiplied by distance from the xx axis, right? But what is y? Y is basically your extreme fiber. So what is the extreme fiber in terms of xx axis? So the, the, the most distance you have from xx axis in this cross section is either in this way, here, this point, or this point. So it happens to be that this, this value is the same as this, right? P is applied exactly at this point. So our extreme fiber distance is basically, again, half of the depth plus flange width plus another flange width. So it's 250 divided by 2 plus 2 times 76, the same as this value. Divided by IXX that we know we calculated for this whole cross section. Plus, what about MYY, right? For MYY, again, it's the same condition. So about the YY axis, what is the moment? The perpendicular distance. So the moment, MYY, is P, the force, multiplied by the distance. What is the distance? The distance is from the, this, this value from here to here, right? So you can see that this is the value. So this is the E Y value, right? E Y value. So this was the X value that we know, and this is the Y value that we know, right? And this is basically your P multiplied by this distance, E Y, which in this case is half of the depth, right? Half of the depth, which is 250 divided by two. Now for X value, which is the distance from the Y Y axis perpendicular and to the extreme fiber, which is from basically go perpendicular from this axis, which is this way or or that way, right? This this way. So from y y perpendicular, which is this way, it's going to be either this point or this point, right? And in this case, it's symmetric, right? So it's going to be basically this point. So the distance is this x, right? Which is going to be half of the depth of the web, half the depth of the channel, plus a full depth, right? So 250 divided by two plus 250. That's your extreme distance, right? So as you can see, you see you can notice the difference between eccentricity, EY, and X, 
which is the distance to the extreme fiber. In this case, our extreme fiber is here, this fiber, right? And that distance and this distance is different. So this MYY and MXX are completely dependent on where the force is applied. But X and Y are the properties of the cross section, right? So if you, if you look at the cross section, it doesn't matter where the, the force P is applied, your X and Y, your X and Y, which was this value and this value, would not change. So you could apply the force P here, you could apply the force here at this point, at this point, anywhere, it doesn't matter. Your X and Y are, will be the same because they are the property of the cross section itself. However, this MXX and MYY, which have basically component, a component of distance in them, this which is eccentricity, EY and EX, will change by where the force is applied. So that's how we are going to differentiate between MY, but basically this distance and this value. And IYY is again known, we calculated from uh, the previous moment of inertia calculation, and we can just substitute, substitute that value here. And again, like I just skipped this because this is pretty, uh, uh, pretty easy to, to calculate. This is the force, the axial force divided by the total area, which is 10 times 569. And this is sigma label, we just put the sigma label value back here. And we basically solve this equation, right? And we'll find out that P is less than or equal to 1,506.7 kilo Newton. We're going to basically repeat this process for interaction method, but only with one difference, and that is just use the interaction formula. And as you can see, everything is pretty much the same. The only difference, which is highlighted here, is this these basically red values, right? So everything else is the same. Every other calculation is basically exactly the same as we had before, right? The old distances and everything else. But the only difference is this, is that basically we are taking into account flexural stress and axial stress separately. So we're basically putting 161.56.4 axial stress and 224 bending stress, right? About both axes. And when you use this formula, and as you can see, again, like this is one, this is like my label, and the, the only reason is we basically divide uh, sigma label, sigma b, sigma b here. And pre previously, we only basically divide by sigma label. So this was sigma label, this was sigma label. That's the only difference. So you can see that our p in this case is less than or equal to 1,936. Now, if we compare these two values, we can see that for the label stress method, we got this value. And for the interaction method, we got this value. So what we can say in general is that the allowable stress method is actually a little bit more com conservative. And the reason is for interaction method, we are more precise. We are taking into account the effect of flexure separately. And uh, that basically, uh, and that, that's why you basically end up with a higher value for interaction method because we are more precise. However, for, for the allowable stress method, we are just basically summing everything up. And we're just saying that, okay, sigma allowable, uh, is our allowable stress no matter if we are calculating our stress for bending or axial. So this is basically what we are going to take away from this question. The allowable stress method is more conservative and the interaction method is more precise. If you enjoyed the video, please like and comment down below and subscribe for more content about problem solving in structural engineering. Stay safe and goodbye.